Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody out there in podcast land. This is Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. This is Hamza. And I am David. And before we get started, I do want to say happy Green Day for all of the Eagles fans out there. So (laughs) will we have the Eagles curse that we are so used to for generations, or will we be happier today? I just want to throw that out there. (laughs) (laughs) I'm also bringing that up because we do have a fellow Philadelphian that is on our podcast today by the name of Jermaine Quick. He is the principal at Illadel Styles Entertainment and has extensive work in the entertainment industry, including a recent movie that was just released. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to the podcast. Welcome, Jermaine. Hey, how y'all doing today? Who and everybody is on an awesome and amazing day on purpose. Absolutely. Absolutely. So I did mention that, you know, before we get into you, uh, happy Green Day for the Eagles fans out there. And here in Atlanta, we actually have three Eagles bars throughout the city. So there is a heavy, heavy concentration. Uh, and I wanted to know if you're in Philly, there are some people that aren't Eagles fans in Philly. Are you one of those people? No, I'm actually an Eagles fan, and it, I bleed green. And But uh, we do have some Cowboys fans out here, literally. Uh, my best friend is a Cowboys fan, and she uh, throws that in my face a lot, but they're not to be talked about today. We're talking about the Eagles and their uh, exciting uh, situation going on right now, and that's what we're all about. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The Cowboys not today. <laughs> not today, man. We were actually, a friend of mine, we were going to uh, report his mom to the police because she obviously dropped him on his head when he was a little because he's yeah. a Cowboys fan of Philly, right? <laughs> right. That's a no-no. So, that is a no-no. So I'm excited about uh, speaking with you today, Jermaine. Um, one, because you're in Philadelphia. I, I was actually born in Philadelphia. I was raised in Jersey. And then during the teen years, I moved down south. But uh, to get this out of the way, since we are talking about green, are you related to Mike Quick? I wish. Uh, uh, I think that uh, I would have made some different moves in life, you know, money gun. <laughs> but uh, no, nah, no, nah, not at all. <laughs> okay. All right. Thought I ask. I'm, I'm sure you get asked that all the time. I wasn't sure. So <laughs> All my life. All my life. <laughs> now I need to meet him so that we can, maybe we, we are related. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, you know what? Know. To be honest, and, and maybe I'll put the battery in your back for this, Jermaine. So uh, I want to say, like, oh, my goodness, about 20 years ago, we were watching Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, just like everyone else, right? And then the gra- their grandma on there, we were like, okay, you know, they were introduced to grandma on the show. But at the, during the credits, her last name was Capers. And I remember my mom, like, yo, uh, how cool would it be if, that was our, if she was related to us? Our, our, our family name is Capers. And – you know, we kind of went about our business. And then we found out years later that she was related to us. And with Facebook and everything else, it was like a reunion just because we did a genealogy report to find out everyone, you know, a lot of people don't know their history. And you may be related to Mike Quick if you do some preliminary research. I never know. Never, never, know, never no. You are correct. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep that yeah. in the back of the, the, the sensory board there. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. <laughs> so you're not going after child support. <laughs> you my right, right. What do you exactly. say to the nice man? What do you say to the right. nice man? Are you my daddy? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you owe me some back money, buddy. <laughs> all, all those so, pocket toys you did not get me. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> now, another Philly thing that I, I do have to ask you about is you are the the principal of Illadel Styles Entertainment. And when I saw that, I immediately thought of one of my favorite bands of The Roots, and one of their albums is Illadel's Half-Life, and wanted to know the origin of your company, or the name at least right now. That's funny you say that. Um, I went to school at the Art Institute of Philadelphia. Um, I interned at Sigma Sound Studios, where the Roots actually first started recording their first album, Static. And so I got to run into um, 
Black Thought. We used to do ciphers, um, um, rap ciphers in the studio with us, him and Scott Storch, and, and, and Q, Quest Love was always downstairs producing, but we were upstairs. And um, at that time, they were, they were into this mode called the Dynasty, um, and that was like a, a hip-hop group, I would say, but more so like, you know, sometimes you have groups that go after this sp- special casualty name that just defines what a group is, and, and they were called the Fifth Dynasty. And so um, as we were doing the ciphers, you know, I just liked how he just had a persona, like he, he was just like a thorough guy. And, you know, that whole representing Illadel- um, Philadelphia, you know, that Illadel funk type thing, that was like a common thing back then in the, in the early 90s. So um, I just capitalized on the name um, and ran with it. And, and when I finished school, um, when I was starting my entrepreneurship program in 2001 at Temple, I used the name Illadel and collaborated with Styles because I have so many different uh, styles as far as production, as far as uh, filming and video and things like that. And I wanted our, my company to be multimedia. So I kind of branched off with the name and just ran with it. And I thought it was just a cool thing to do, you know, because it would just follow my history. Absolutely. Uh, that, that's a really great story. Um, I'm thinking since, you know, you are, since you're in the entertainment field and you talked about your history with the uh, Art Institute of Philadelphia and so on and so forth. I do want to talk about a, uh, a brief soapbox moment for me. Uh, since I am uh, a hip hop or music fan, fanatic forever, shout out to my, my cousin Tony. He was old, a lot older than me. He put me on the WHAT AM way back in the day. And if you don't know, that was uh, where Lady B was, where she first started before she got on Power 99 in the early 80s. So yep. the the soapbox moment that I, I wish was a little bit better is uh, you have New York, you have your different regions, right? So you have New York, you have even Jersey. There's like these, these clusters where they actually get together and stick together as a, as a movement. And you don't really see that as a whole, at least today in Philadelphia, you had, you know, the sound of Philadelphia in the seventies and all that, but Currently, you don't see like this huge push, at least outside of the region, for Philadelphia. Uh, what's your take on that? Well, the game really got uh, saturated, and from my history of, I've been in the entertainment business in Philadelphia since I in, since the '90s, and to see it transform over time, a lot of artists got signed from Philadelphia, left Philadelphia, never came back, never introduced any type of revenue or business to the city, and so the city became more selfish in nature. And so um, it became closed-minded, uh, more, uh, I'm all about self, um, it's, it's, it's about me, and, and you have a new generation that's coming up that doesn't even understand or even know anything about, you know, the sound of Philadelphia, we don't even have a sound. Uh, we're so uh, uh, saturated with everyone else's sound. We don't have a sound at all. And so without a sound and without the history, the embedded history that is needed to understand that, you know, it takes a group to actually make the, the city big, um, everybody's out for self. And so you, you, won't, you won't see until artists start to realize that supporting one another um, can bring more of a fan base to the city uh, with the conglomeration, They, you won't see that in Philadelphia. I mean, everybody's always running to New York, or now everybody's running to Atlanta because they think that's the, milk, the, the land of cream and milk and honey. But just like Atlanta is popping now, they'll soon die down, and then somebody else will be popping, just like the West Coast was popping for a minute, you know, and down down south and so forth. You know, everybody has their moments of pop, you know, and so Philadelphia has, this beyond the, the sound of Philadelphia, as far as hip-hop is concerned, Philadelphia has yet to have its pop. I mean, we have individuals that have had popped from Philadelphia, but as far as the city being 
all the attention coming to the city, we have yet to have that. And uh, so I guess that's why everybody wants the Eagles to win. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, it probably brings some, you know, nostalgia here, you know, something, you know, just some aura of, you know, camaraderie, I don't know. But we don't have the city, and that's just because everybody's out for self. So, um, yeah, definitely. Go Eagles. Excited. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, there's a lot of economics associated with it we could get into later, but I, I do want to mention that there, there is some guy, some young guy on my Instagram feed who is, I forget his name right now, uh, hopefully it'll come to me, but he is doing this whole throwback 80s, 90s beats with his raps, and he's getting a lot of push, it looks like, from, you know, come the on, old guard, if you will. I believe so. Del PZ. Okay, so Del PZ has been doing that for a while now, and uh, he was with uh, my, my friend of mine that does a lot of filming with me. His name is Rob Swartz. Um, Rob Swartz was introduced to him. Rob Swartz on Who, Who Mag Magazine. Um, he also does a lot of uh, uh, he owns a lot of uh, TV n- network stations across the country. And so uh, Rob Swartz got a hold of this guy and um, put him in, and gave him a distribution deal. And ever since then, you know, showcasing him uh, uh, has been uh, a big thing, and he's been winning some awards. He's actually been in the Grammys a couple of times. Um, He's really very lyrical um, as far as, like, the old school um, connotation of rap. But he doesn't get a lot of respect in Philadelphia because the new wave is the Meek Mill um, um, uh, wave um, or Cardi V um, wave, you know, so that that is – Sometimes that gets washed out, you know. I mean, he's good at what he does, and he should get respect for what he does um, because that is the foundation of hip-hop. But because mumble rap is the the way to go now, everybody's just following the fad, you know. So, mm-hmm. um, and not saying that Meek Mills does mumble rap because I'm actually in Meek Mills' new video, and I don't want to – I need to correct that. But – <laughs> that type of flow, <laughs> I need to make sure I get that right. That type of flow as far as, um, you know, just singing on a track or whatever the case may be, that is the, the new the new wave, you know. Um, and so if you're not with the, the new wave, you kind of get washed out, you know. So. It, it actually made, when you mentioned Meek Mill, it made me, that's what actually was the impetus for me getting on the soapbox. It wasn't more of the, oh, man, I miss Steady B and all that in Philly, but it was more of, uh, like, battle rap. And so you had uh, Meek Mill and you had, um, oh, man. I mean, all these guys in Philly that were uh, really big in the battle rap scene in the early 2000s. They were on Smack DVD and all this and that. And so, you know, Meek came out under that, you know, when they say Meek with the braids. And... But in the battle rap scene, there's this whole New York push, there's this whole New Jersey push, and you just don't have, uh, at least on a grander scale, the Philadelphia push because there's a lot of spitters out there. And like you said, they're short-sighted if they're only trying to be out for self, as as we're seeing, because they're not in the the conversation like a lot of other regions are. Yeah, well, a lot of other regions understand the concept of unity and um, like I said, because of the way artists have been treated here in Philadelphia, um, they don't have – it's cognitive behavior. They don't have that, that, that unity because there was no, never any unity within the signings of different individuals and, and stuff like that. You know, people get their – get signed from here again. You know, they don't help those who actually help them get to the position they were in. You know, so when you have that type of mentality, you know, everybody just thinks for self, you know. And and I mean, I even had the news. I I don't want to even put her name out. Well, I might as well. (laughs) I even had one of the news editors from Fox say the same thing to me. Like, we were just basically, uh, you know, talking about movies and music. and, And she was like, yeah, Philadelphia has always been one of those stagnated brackets that, you know, everybody's out for self. Mm. That was sad. So, I'm sorry. So you were, yeah, going from ciphers with Black Thought, which is awesome, a whole other conversation to geek out on. But you also were doing film, and you had talked about Temple University. What, what made you 
want to look at all aspects of entertainment instead of going down one one vein, so to speak. I was good at it. Um, I mean, not even to be boastful, but um, I started out. Let me tell you this history, and then you know, we go from there. I was in high school, and I've been rapping since I was in the eighth grade. A beatboxing, beatboxing was my my main thing. Um, um, I got noticed when I was in the eighth grade for doing that talent shows. Every high school or middle school yearbook, you would always see me on stage either beatboxing or rapping. Um, so in uh, the, the, my twelfth grade year, I, got, I met a, a, a guy named um, Sean Phillips um, who was working with a, a female named Heather Henderson. You might have known her. You've seen her in a couple of movies like Splash. Um, uh, uh, she was just the one with uh, Tyrese Gibson. But anyway, me and her started off early at an early age, uh, 19, and we did a song called Give It Up. And it was under Simon Rosen. I'm, if you're not familiar with Simon Rosen, he's a Philadelphia music lawyer. Um, he started a record label called Simon Says Records um, in 90. And he really didn't know anything about hip hop as much as anything, but he was learning and growing. So he, they signed me under that label. And this was before I even went to school. And I started touring with Heather, and we were performing this song with a, uh, uh, what was her name? Um, this, this, remember, I got the power. I can't remember her name right off the back, but uh, she, uh, uh, we were touring with her for a minute. Mm -hmm. uh, and she, uh, and, and, and it was going fine. It was going well, but uh Heather decided to change gears and she stopped singing. And so that left me to be on my own. And Simon was not ready to handle a hip hop artist. So I ended up uh, making my own album. And at the time I made my album, it was during a psychedelic period with uh, PM Dawn and, 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 and stuff like that. But on the hip hop side of things, hip hop was getting rougher and Wu-Tang came out. So my album got washed away because I was doing psychedelic music and all the underground was doing woo type of drama. And so um, I learned a lot by being in the studio, wasting all my income tax money to do that. And I said, you know what, I'm going back to school so I can learn the business. And so I went to school at the Art Institute uh, to learn video and music production. And when I was in school, I got great grades. Um, the audio was easy. Um, for me because I like sound and I've been listening to music since I was a little kid so I love sound so I was able to tackle that but the video became second nature because uh, in all my classes I was able to tell stories and I'm a good storyteller so uh, with film it just it made it possible I, I received great grades in that so I would end up doing people's videos um, I end up working with a, a TV show called um, Urban Expressions um, and Eventually, over the years, I became, like, one of the directors of the show. Um, and um, video just was, like, a part of just – you couldn't you couldn't mix – you couldn't leave out the two. You know, music, video, it, it all went together. It's, like, all part of entertainment. But to visually see what you're trying to say and to make it a video, it, it just was all part of the, the chemistry. And I became good at both, and I was able to even go to high school and – teach some of the kids um, video productions at Bartram, my old alma mater. And so that worked out very well. And uh, um, I just continued on. I mean, it's so many, it's 8 million stories within that, that cluster that I can tell you who I met, what I've done with the company and, and uh, the different things. But video, was, it just started out as just, uh, just a part of the, the, the whole culture. You can't have rap without video, you know. Um, and, mm -hmm. you know, I, I've learned from a lot of the best in the business just watching how they edit, how they, they cut from scene to scene. And I just picked it up very fast. And then, and I, I continue to still learn each day. So so what was the transition from hip-hop videos? Did you start doing shorts and then that came, that turned into full-length movies? What, what was the process? Um, the process uh, came from a DVD magazine. Um, at the time, DVD magazines were basically interviews of – um, artists, rappers, rapping on uh, DVD as uh, what I did was I actually got a press pass from the city, became a legit uh, a media company, and um, I was able to interview all the artists that would come in the city, Jay-Z, Beyonce. Uh, when we had Live Aid in Philadelphia, I was the only DVD magazine in Philadelphia 
acquiring interviews from Russell Simmons, uh, Chris Tucker, um, a lot of actors and stuff like that. And I became a, a, a underground name um, with that. Illidale Styles Entertainment DVD magazine was an underground name with that type of source. And so I would take hip hop artists who rap and mix them with these top um, entertainers and put it in a DVD magazine to give them exposure. And so I noticed that the DVD game started to dwindle. Nobody was buy- buying DVDs anymore. So <clears throat> I said, well, let me try a movie. And it just and it just, just popped in my head. I said, you know, well, I'm filming. You know, it's nothing to film. So let me just try a little short movie. So I, my first movie was a 40-minute movie. It was called Rise Like Cream. And I took artists in the city, you know, that had a buzz at the time, and asked them, did they want to do a movie? And they was all excited because they never thought about doing a movie. So, you know, it's something to do, right? So I put them in the, you know, I, I drew up the script and um, uh, put them in the movie, did the score, sound score for it, and we uh, premiered it at a community college with 100 people, 40-minute movie. I was excited, you know, just to see 100 people come see a 40-minute movie. I was, you know, too, too ecstatic at that time. I was like, okay, wow, we're doing something, you know. Um, and it, it, it went on YouTube and many people watched it and we just thought we were doing things, you know, it's not instant viral like it is today. Like when I put that movie out, there was no such thing as instant viral like today, today, I mean, you know, something crazy can go viral. I don't know. But, uh, it was a lot of views for that time period that we were in. So, um, and you know, we just, I just kept pushing from there. And once I saw that I can do a 40 minute, then I did a full length. And then that full length, we went from 100 people to 450 people at community college. So we rented out the bigger room. And then uh, my third movie, um, we went from 450 to 560, almost 570 people. And then uh, now we're we're at the movie theater. (laughs) And we just sold out 700 seats at a studio movie room. So film has been something that I... uh, that's been embedded in me. Um, it was definitely a passion um, because I love music and I just love doing the whole thing. And I think I was just blessed with the talent to do it all. So I just kind of put it together like that. I saw your, your trailer for the American bully and it looks like, I mean, especially with your, your vast experience that you're able to actually do the score and direct. I mean, you're doing, you're wearing many hats as many, uh, independent filmmakers do uh, what 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 aren't you doing let's focus on what you are I mean let's you're doing so many hats what, I mean I guess the bigger question is I, I want to know about all the things that you're doing but where did you feel that you also had this is the second part what did you feel you had to either step away and outsource some of it so that you had more time to focus on what you're really good at guess what there was no outsourcing project has been done from the muscle. We are actually on a state-to-state tour right now. Um, I had to, uh, I got a city citation from Philadelphia, and um, uh, the mayor of Salisbury, Maryland, has just gave me the coin to the city, and we're going to go out there and, and talk to the kids about this uh, epi- national epidemic of bullying, which is in all the schools across the country. And there was no outsourcing right now. I'm working on a distribution deal um, to get into iTunes and um, Amazon Prime. Um, through distributor and so all the things that I've I, I became when you own a business you become very organized and so um, certain things that you want to outsource you can't because you put it in other people's hands and it never gets done at the time you need it or they procrastinate on it or whatever the case may be so um, for me to have these projects to go the way they have been going um, they would have ne- never gotten done well, I've delegated many things to people and things have like flopped. And that's another thing with Philly. Uh, people don't take their business, uh, uh, they don't take it serious. And so they will procrastinate on many things. And I've seen many projects that attempt to come out and don't come out. And I haven't been able to successfully single handedly produce projects that have results. And so at this point, um, the only next level to me is to have to be under a company that understands my worth and that will um, bring those same qualities to the table that I can mainly concentrate on the storytelling as well as the 
um, um, the production of it. Um, so, and if, if if push comes to shove, um, just being around people that understand the quality of work we were trying to bring to the table, that would be an awesome experience. But in Philadelphia, film is not, people are just starting to do film. They don't really understand the concept of what, what it takes to be a filmmaker, what it takes to have the, the score done, what it takes to um, to manage actors and, and artists and, and, and different talent and to cater to their needs and to... Uh, just adjust your whole uh, aura to the vibe of the movie. Um, it's it's a lot of work, you know. Um, you need a, a definitely you need a team that understands that that motive. But I have just been blessed that people are not afraid of me. They are actually um, happy to be around me because I actually teach them along the way, and so. Um, it, I've just been blessed, man, just to be around actors that just believe in my vision and just are willing to get on set regardless of where we at. As long as I see them, they're good. I mean, I had uh, in Concealed Habitat, we had C. Knowledge from Diggable Planets, who was one of the main characters. He played a, a, a stepfather who raped his uh, stepdaughter in Concealed Habitat, um, which is my second film, which we, you know, like I said, had 450 people in the movie theater. And we're talking about uh, award Grammy winning see knowledge from Diggable Planets, and he came on scene. I'm not going to tell you what, he, what I offered him to, to do it, but it was very bare minimum, and he did it because he believed in my vision, and he came out and he enjoyed the movie. And so we're talking about, you know, people who are embedded in the industry who see my work and believe in my vision. Um, if you haven't seen any of my uh, videos, you'll see people like Buster Rhymes and Trey Songs, and they are giving me a shout-out a tremendous shout out. And I just say, yo, shout out to each, uh, Philadelphia Styles. No, they're bigging it up because what I, my, my aura, what I present to the table is, is believable. It's, 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 you know, it is what it is, you know? So I, I'm, I've been blessed, man. I, you know, there is not a hat that I don't fill and there's not a hat that I can't fill because I just been blessed with the talent, man. We just, just trying to, uh, capitalize on the, um, the economics of all, all of it in, in, in businesses in Philadelphia. So that's what we're doing. I was speaking about the the concept of uh, Fresh Prince of Bel Air again, right? Where he was doing his thing in Philly from the show, right? From he was doing his thing in Philly, but they moved him to Bel Air because he had better opportunities, or they felt he had better opportunities out in LA. And I'm bringing it up because over the weekend on my Instagram feed, I saw that uh, some promo for the movie Honor Up, which is a Dane Dash movie. And, you know, Kanye West is the major producer behind that. And, you know, they're doing a lot of promo. And just like the Fresh Prince where he had to go to L.A., Kanye's from Chicago, but he didn't really, really, you know, start digging in until he actually moved to New York. And... I was just wondering, has there been any opportunities or any thoughts to, you know, we love the, we love our home, Philadelphia, but there's, it seems like there may be better opportunities in either New York or LA. Have you ever thought about that? The thought is there. The thought has been there for years. Um, the connections are not um, as free as I want them to be to, to make that transition. And so, I'm kind of stuck in the middle lane of it. And so uh, that's a hard question to ask because just to get up and move, um, uh, <laughs> it's kind of a hard thing to do when you just bought, bought a house and you, you know, you're trying to, you know, live a, a certain lifestyle. And so, uh, at this, if I was young, I think if I was, if I'd have known what I know now in my 20s, I think uh, I probably would have been moved. I probably would have been, took that jump, that leap of faith because I would have had still more time on my plate to uh, capitalize on life, period. Um, for what I learned socially, between the ages of 20 and 60, or 30 and 60, you might as well say, 
is your most working periods, and that's the time where your career should be settled into. <laughs> and so I'm I'm above that. And so and when you when you get well, not above 60, but I'm in that bracket, so in that median bracket. And so when you get in that age bracket, it's not as easy to, to pick up and leave. And then if it doesn't work, because everything isn't guaranteed to work either, you know. Trends change, people change, a lot of things, and you have to be on point with it all in order for it to, to break or, or continue to have success. And so if I was to do that at this point, you know, that's taking a major risk. You know, and it, it, it's a blessing if you make it, and then it's a, it's a downer if you don't because you'll be passing me by on the street with a cup in my hand, and you'll say, well, damn, I remember him. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, you damned if you do, damned if you don't. But like I said, I'll take that, that major leap because that's something that you do while you're young, if you have that understanding, but you still also have to have the knowledge of what you're getting into. So eh, it's a, it's a toss up. And, uh, you know, I've, I've heard many stories though, of people who made it, you know, like at, at a, at a late age, but some actors and different things like that. And, you know, it, it works for some people, but it doesn't work for everybody. And everybody doesn't have that grand scale, you know? So you have to live within your means too. You know, it's nice to have a dream to, have a movie, you know, I, I have movies out. I mean, I have four albums on iTunes right now. I have uh, two two movies that's going into circulation right now. I'm working on my new book, The Beholder, right now. And so I, I have things in the making. Um, but to get up and go, that is a leap of faith that you have to be strong enough to do and be willing to suffer the consequence thereof. And I don't know if I'm willing to suffer the consequence to being on the street when I just bought a house. Yeah. Oh, definitely, definitely. Uh, it, it, it was maybe I don't know if it did for you, David, but it made me really happy that you know we actually have uh, even a podcast talking about intrinsic motivation from a homie's perspective because you know it, over the past year we've dealt we've had spoken with so many different people where um, we may speak with them at the current moment, and but when they looked at their life it wasn't linear at all, like of what they planned. And here they are in this space where they're living beyond their wildest dreams and cause, because of that leap of faith, right? So it's kind of like where um, I might, I might beatbox and uh, we're kind of going, we're going to go into your movie in a second because we're, we're going to talk about bullying, but let's just say I was beatboxing and I thought I was great. But then when I went to the cafeteria, I was, I was great at home, but then I went to the cafeteria and did it and everybody laughed. But 10 years later, I'm like, it's a bad example. I'm the best beatboxer out there just because I believe in myself. So a little bit, I was just like <laughs> riding with you. But then I was like, Charlie Murphy, you know, he didn't really pop till after 40. God bless the dead. Uh, Steve Harvey, he didn't really pop till like after 40. Oh, there's just countless people of, of, of watching the weather, if you will. There's some people that say it's partly cloudy. And some people that say it's partly sunny, like who's right? It's still 50-50. It's just your perception. So um, that's what I was thinking when you were saying that. Yeah, no, it, and it, you know what? And I'm trying to take the best moves. I guess I'm a cautious guy. I try to take the best moves that's possible um, because, you know, I stuck my neck out there a lot to even get to this level. I mean, so I'm quite sure I'm going to make some more crazy in, in a, in, in a, in a that's going to make me uh, be noticed. I mean, we, the whole movie got a, 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 a news broadcast, you know, for three minutes, not 30 seconds either. Like, you know, they really, the, the movie's a very deep movie. And so I believe if I keep pushing that something later, is going to happen. I do believe in myself. But I've always learned, because I've been through a lot in my life, and I've always learned to not be super whole on leaping out and have to fall back on because once you do that um, at a certain age you're out there by yourself like you are literally out there my mom died when I was 19 I never knew my dad and I have a son that looks you know that believes in what I'm doing and you know is looking forward to seeing some uh, uh, future things happen and 
leaping out like that and with no net, it's just it's at this age, it's kind of like uh, that's a hard pill to swallow. I mean, I understand. I be, trust me, I believe totally in myself. I wouldn't do the project if I didn't. Um, but not knowing, having the connections, not having any of the connections necessary to make any of it pop and not knowing where it's going to go. It's kind of hard to just say, okay, I'm just going to go out there in L.A. and just bring the movie out there. I don't know nobody out there. Well, it's just going to happen like that. Sometimes you usually get connections through people you know or, you know I mean, and one connection leads to another and then so forth and so forth. But if you have no connections, it's like, what? Where are you going? Like, where are you going with that? Like, this doesn't make any sense. Like, it's got to make some type of sense, you know. You know, one plus one does equal two, doesn't it? <laughs> 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 kind of. I mean, we're we're, we're kind of laughing. I, I hear David snickering in the background. Um, one thing that I will make a suggestion because I, I do want to hear about your your movie and the promotion about American Bully and so on. Uh, but just before we head off on this tangent, um, I do suggest you spend. I think it's only like three to five dollars to go to Amazon. And uh, one of our first podcasts was called The Godwink, and. I don't know if you've ever heard of that book before, but it's really good in the sense that um, once you, to use a very simple example, is before you bought your car, right? Like you had a picture like, oh, I want to buy this car, right? And then you buy it. And then once you buy it, you see it everywhere you go. Like it wasn't in your awareness until you actually got it. And so what the book does is like, if you look back, probably even on your life, like all these Godwinks, all these circumstances that would have been like, is this a coincidence or not? Well, you know, and it leads me to today. So, you know, if you, if you would, I would really highly suggest that to, to check out that book. I think that you'd get a lot out of it. Cool. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I understand so, where you're going with it. Like it's, 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 it's one of those things. Like I didn't, when I was started doing films in Philadelphia, there was not many people doing it. Um, now that I've on my fourth film, now everybody's doing the film and documentaries and different things like that. And it's like, has it always been here? Not really. Or if it was, it wasn't as big. And now it's a big thing. So I do believe in timing. Timing is everything. Um, you know, uh, I've put many eggs in the basket. I mean, I don't, I don't only do film. I do production work as well um, for music. And I have many eggs in the basket, but I think timing is everything. And the only reason why I believe that this American Bully is going to go far, movie is going to go far, is because I didn't plan the timing on everything that's going on in my life. I mean, if you really want to get technical, I... Uh, in July, I was a, armed, a federal armed security officer, and that's how I was able to sustain the income um, to buy the equipment, to keep up with everything. And in July, I had an accidental discharge from my, my firearm. Um, I was dismissed. However, by the time uh, the movie was being promote, um, pushed, it was National Bullying Awareness Month, and I knew nothing about it. And so I'm putting this movie out, telling everybody about this movie and getting them amped. And I knew I was going to put it in the movie theater because there was no independent artist in Philadelphia to ever do it single-handedly, put it in the movie theater. And all of a sudden, I got this, uh, I met, with, I had a couple of connections. I met up with some people and got a news story. The city's giving me a citation and all of this stuff was happening. And it had nothing to do with me actually pushing it. It was just timing everything was just happening and, and and god just saying like hey well you know i'm a spiritual guy so I, I, god was just saying hey like you know this is what i need to be done and this is what's going on and it's just been going in that direction ever since and so i always i've always been a spiritual person to believe that if the timing is right everything is going to flow right you know um a lot of things that i in the past the mistake I was trying to control everything. And when I tried to control everything, it wasn't going the way I was planning. But as I just planted the seeds and continued to nourish them, then they started to, to prosper. And everybody, life has a different different outcome. You know, um, there's many people that have, have great talent but don't succeed. And, they, and you wonder why they didn't succeed. And, and it's sometimes, mostly, it's all about timing. Really. Yeah. So what is talk about the American bully? What, what's it? What you talk about how it, how 
it seems like the stars are aligning right now for you to promote it. Uh, what, what, let's talk about the bullying as a whole. Is it more of in high school or elementary school where uh, the guy, you know, you're, push, you, you're fighting after school or, you know, is, is it still the same issues of bullying? Obviously, I know it's not, but what, what's the current climate of bullying that made you want to bullying get Bullying is not just a school thing, and that's why this film is um, getting a, a attention. Bullying is a national epidemic, period, whether it's in school, whether it's at the job place, or whether it's in the streets. And so this movie is called, it's about a biracial family dealing with the issues of bullying, period. Um, and so... The father's a bully at work. He bullies all his employees. The son is a bully at school, following after his father, and the mother has cancer. And before she dies, she's trying to get them to understand the repercussions of their actions. And uh, circumstances happen. They live in a plush neighborhood of suburbs, and they're, they're living fine. And the father all of a sudden loses his job at the corporate level, pushes him back to move him and his son uh, after the the mother passes uh, to the hood now or to the urban neighborhood to where now they both become uh, bullied. Um, the, the same people that they um, bully, they're being bullied by. So um, it's more of a, a storyline of showing that, you know, the chips may fall where they lay, uh, karma is a bitch type situation. Um, it's more just uh, facing the reality that bullying is just not in school, and it starts from it, – it can carry on beyond school. You know, some people get bullied in school and don't show out until they get on the job market or the job um, um, field where they may get a position and then start treating people nasty. Um, bullying can also be in the streets. Obviously, we know with uh, the crime and the drug the drug lords uh, – Challenging their energy um, into each other and killing innocent bystanders, um, and then you also have your bully, obvious, your obvious bullying in school, but more of they have today cyberbullying, where you know you can be online and, and feel intimidated. You know, so there's uh, when it's a national, when it's considered a national epidemic, it's because of the range of the bullying and how far it can go. I mean, you had a uh, several deaths in the last five years um, with kids who actually were bullied and came to school with a gun and, and, and retaliated, you know. So there is, I mean, tremendously so many multi-angles of bullying that you can't really just peg it as, oh, it's just a student or a kid's thing, but it, it's, it's an adult thing as well. So the, the movie is actually on that, that, that level, just, you know, just deals with everything, not just one thing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it was it, it was interesting about uh, like you said it goes beyond school because you know I think traditionally most people would associate bullying with school and then again this is about it's the first time on a, on our podcast that I keep bringing up Instagram but over over the weekend you had um, Ja Rule and Fifty Cent going at it and you're like man this is so a beat that's been going on for twenty plus years like when are they gonna let it go and obviously it is on some bullying level Ja Rule doesn't have half of the the stature that 50 Cent does today, uh, but they it seems like for some people's lives, they're stuck on that one moment of, you always push me in a locker in ninth grade, and, and I'm going to treat you this way. You're like, dude, I'm 38 years old now. That was a whole other life ago. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. And this is what we're talking about when it, you know, it's just trans, it, it just, transfers from one era to the to the next, you know, so it doesn't necessarily have to be in school. It can go beyond that, you know, and some people hold on to things for no reason. Uh, you know, it's just that negative energy. I try to stay with people around people with positive vibes, and, you know, it's just kind of hard to find in today's world, you know, uh, when you have so so many people. Uh, I, social, social media is a gift and a curse. You know that. It's a, it's a gift when you're trying to market your, uh, your product and you're trying to get noticed or whatever, and then it's a curse when it when it draws back from people who just don't have any integrity in life and they just, you know, get on your your blog or get on your situation and want to down it and want to and, 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 and not really participate, but just to be arrogant and ignorant, you know. And so um, they said if you don't have haters, then you, you're not popping. But who needs all that negative energy all the time? <laughs> you know, I don't know, it's just... You know, it's that's what bullying is. Like, it's it's a cyber thing. It's a, it's a physical thing. I mean, back in the day when you got bullied, at least only 
the people in school or on the block knew about it. But now, you know, people pull out their phone and they world star, you know, they world star mm-hmm. in it and everybody gets to see it go viral so fast. So you wonder why these kids are killing themselves because it's not just normal, regular people or people around the way seeing it. It's the whole world, like, you know, and then they keep repeating it. They keep uh, reposting it and, 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 and regraining it, and, and then you keep seeing it all over the place. It just makes you feel, you know, alone and, 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 and vulnerable, you know? Yeah. Jermaine, how long did it take you to film American Bully? Oh, shoot it. that's a great that's a great question. Um, it prob it took me six, I would say it took me six months because how I filmed it was we only filmed on Saturdays and Sundays, and yeah. this brings me to the the gorilla shooting uh, situation <laughs> where um, basically uh, if you don't have a big budget, you want to uh, <laughs> basically get your cast to be aware that we may be shooting seven, six o'clock in the morning, seven o'clock, eight o'clock, whatever, um, at certain scenes so that we can, uh, get there before the police come and shut you down. So, <laughs> uh, we would only film on Saturdays and Sundays and we would film from like maybe eight to 12 in the morning, you know, when traffic is less and, uh, we get a lot of scenes knocked out and a lot of things done. Um, but it was just done on a, you know, on that type of organized uh, state. So uh, at six months it took. So you're talking about six months every Saturday and Sunday just grabbing people. Sometimes if it was an indoor scene or whatever, we can do it on on a weekday depending on the staff schedule. But most people I pick up, Saturdays and Sundays was the best day for them. So that's why it took six months. Mm, okay. Seems like you'd be really efficient that way too. You know, it, it, like you're talking about blessing and curse. Sometimes when you have that shoestring budget, you're so more efficient, and there's not a, a lot of fat, right? Where it's just, oh, we got the budget, so it's okay if we go over. I mean, you always hear about movies going over budget, right? And they're like, oh, we'll just get more. So you know, sometimes there is that bonus that you were on shoestring to kind of fine tune everything to get it the way you wanted it. See, I I like it also for the simple fact that if you can learn to work on a shoestring budget, if the opportunity presents itself where you can have a budget, you will know exactly where the money's supposed to go to where as someone that doesn't have an understanding, they will misuse and misguide the money and then wonder why they're not really making a profit. And so... um, it, it's a, it's a definitely a gift to have an understanding of where you need the money to go. I mean, of course, once you get into bigger production, you're going to get into lighting and you're going to get into the extras that go with it. But you still don't want to be in a position where you're paying top quality actors a certain fee and then you're still production-wise under the eight ball, you know. I mean, Spike Lee, I was think I was watching a documentary for him. He uh, Malcolm X cost him... I think on I think eight million dollars or something like that. I mean, it, it, the production was very nice, um, but nobody even remembers the movie that much. I don't know, just my which opinion. Movie I just, which, which movie? Which movie? Malcolm X. We all remember. Well, maybe our generation knows that movie. That's probably better fitting. A better way to look at it. Yeah, Ma- Malcolm X. It was a good movie. Um, Denzel Washington played the uh, uh, Malcolm X, and it was a great yeah. movie. Um, but when you're spending that kind of bread on a movie that didn't really, um, I don't know. I just, I just, it reached, it reached a lot of people, but it didn't resonate as much because people were already against uh, the whole Malcolm X thing anyway. So. I don't know. Right. We're talking sub. You're talking subject matter on that one. Or, yeah, oh, you know. One, I think one would be subject matter, but I think two. In 2017, 2018, we have so much technology, and the beauty of technology is that it's so, so much more powerful than even when Malcolm X came out, right? So if you tried to right. do it today, uh, if Spike Lee's kids wanted to do it, right, they don't have to spend the eight million dollars and still put out a really good product just based off of the technology that exists. Right. right, right. Well, uh, I think more people are spending more money technology-wise on movies like Marvel, uh, Star Wars, and different things like that because of the graphics that it details and the time that it takes to do the green screen and 
and different things like that. So that's where most of their money coming in at. Um, but a regular film, just a heartbeat film, something that just resonates to real life, shouldn't cost that much. Um, it's all about angles. It's all about lighting. It's all about sound. And those things become easier today because technology, like you said, is more far advanced, and you, you can buy the right equipment or rent the right equipment to achieve those goals. And if you, like I said, if you're just talking about a, a heartbeat movie, something that doesn't need a lot of graphics but just tells a great story, uh, you should be able to shoot one of those under 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 to me under five hundred thousand, to me under a hundred thousand. Um, you know, but we're talking about who's the actor in it talking about who's the production company behind it. You know, you're talking about all kinds of crazy stuff. So, you know, when everybody's got their hand in the cookie jar, you know, it's just that's where your the extra money comes from. But just to shoot the money, the movie, uh, as an independent filmmaker, you can do it for under twenty, thirty thousand dollars 30000 truthfully. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I remember when Spike Lee was uh, putting out Chirac, he did a GoFundMe and in Indiegogo. Are you doing any of this crowdsourcing to get your films financed? No, I'm learning to actually do that now. Um, that is one way um, to look at it. But um, when I did, when I actually wrote American Bully, I never even thought about Indiegogo or how big bullying was really across the country. I, I knew it was big, but I didn't know how big it was. And I, I really took it from the perspective of a personal story that happened to me uh, where uh, my brother was killed in Philadelphia. Um, uh, by his best friend and um, the guy that had an opportunity to tell the story to the judge was bullied out of actually telling the truth and the, the killer got set free. So I kind of modeled this story after my, uh, a scene of the story after my brother, um, a lot of different circumstances. So the movie has a personal touch for me um, in, in several different ways. And so um, I never knew how big bullying was going to be. So I never even challenge myself to go to any of the indie sources or anything like that. I, I did do a GoFundMe page for schools that don't have the budget uh, to pay for our services to come out and talk to the kids, but never thought of uh, getting the, uh, other people to finance the movie. It just never crossed my mind. And so I've been, most of these movies I've, I've put out of my own pocket. Uh, so I'm hoping to uh, learn more about, you know, just, having the crowd actually uh, fund the movie, but I'm having a hard time getting them to fund the sponsorship for the schools to to get the uh, conflict resolution they need for these kids. So I don't know. I don't know, I don't know. I don't know how that all works. <laughs> I'm still learning that. Oh, uh, sure. I think we're that's life, right? We're always going to continue learning. If we're not, you know, we would we'll cease to exist. Um, and what's interesting also is awareness. I remember uh, recently Dr. What's his name? Neil deGrasse Tyson, they had asked him, is today better than the 50s and 60s? And he was saying it's better today because of awareness. And, you know, like you said, if it was just on your block or in your neighborhood, people know about it. But so many people in, in the youth fail to realize this, but... <laughs> they're going to jail in greater numbers because they're putting everything on social media. So uh, the, the awareness of bullying is, is a lot, is having a bigger impact because uh, we have data now and, and we can actually determine, you know, what's really happening to kind of stop some of it on some level. So I think the fact that you have this movie out and there's talk about it, it'll only bring more interest to it. So, which is a good thing. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I, I'm scared of where our country is going in the next few years as far as everybody's going to jail um, scenario. Um, I'm very afraid that we're not preparing our country for the growth necessary to compete. Um, I think we spend more money on prisons than we do on education. Um, A lot of uh, training and grants and different things are going in different directions to where, you know, minimum wage jobs are now uh, basically retail jobs. Um, it's hard to get into, oh, at least in the urban areas, it's hard for people to get into jobs that are 
are worth uh, a good when a, a good wage living. You know, what I mean, I mean, middle, there's almost no more middle class. It's just upper class and lower class. <laughs> and I'm just afraid to see uh, where we're going in the next few years. Yet yeah, we have advanced in certain areas, but the, the main areas we're not doing too well. And so, if we're just only worrying about war and different things like that. Bullying is the least of our problems. <laughs> Bullying is just going to be uh, an everyday conversation in a minute. You know, that's just, it's going to be the least of our problems. And so we need to do a whole country wash now, <laughs> truthfully, if we really expect to be, continue to be a superpower in the future. I don't know, just, but I, I worry I about that, that with America. Well, with you, you know, being independent and getting the word out there, I think, you know, it starts on a small level becomes it before it gets bigger. So it makes me think of, uh, like you mentioned earlier, earlier, World Star, right? Like it's one of the most heavily visited sites on the Internet because uh, people are drawn to that type of energy. And I was thinking of Vlad TV because uh, he has, you know, he has a uh, probably a greater balance than a lot of people. He has a lot of acid stuff. But I know that he just recently started a uh, Vlad Stocks on Instagram where he's introducing people who've never gotten into stocks or know anything about it to start looking at it. He's like, if you can afford a pair of Jordans, you can afford a pair of uh, shares in Nike and just changing how people think on a smaller level. So now, you know, you can start talking portfolios and all that in the future. I think it starts on a, on a small scale first and that we're highlighting it, right, talking about bullying and talking about – um, even even from a stock standpoint, I think it was two days ago in the Wall Street Journal, they were talking about the economists have projected uh, a recession once the new commander-in-chief got into office. And the stock market had record gains in 2017, and the commander-in-chief usually would tweet about a company and expect that their shares would go down. And in the article, they were saying that Wall Street's not even really paying attention to what was perceived as cyberbullying, right? If I'm going to affect your stock, uh, <laughs> Wall Street's like, yeah, it's not affecting what we have going on over here. So, you know, it's just, I think it's more of an awareness of people paying attention to, hey, uh, is it partly cloudy or partly sunny outside? Yeah, you brought that scenario up before, and I always think about that you need both sides of the coin in in order to uh, at least have a balance in life. So even if you're looking at it from the partly cloudy, it just makes the person that's saying partly sunny aware that it could be partly cloudy at any given time. (laughs) So I I think that that complete balance keeps us all um, uh, equally motivated, you know, because if I look at something partly cloudy, at least I have the hope that it can be partly sunny. So I think that that's the motivation for those who uh, have a different perspective on seeing, seeing things. Uh, it, it all works, um, but I'm still aware of what could not work as well. You know, that's just all back to marketing the, your movies and marketing your business, you know, taking that leap of faith. It's cool to do that, you know, to jump out on that edge. But at the end of the day, you still have to have the perspective of, okay, well, you're out there. Do you think you're going to get a rope anytime soon? And what about if you don't get that rope? Uh, who's going to be there to pull you up? Or is everybody going to pass by you and put a quarter in your cup? So you have to have that awareness. Even though, you know, you take it this leap of faith and you believe in everything you do, just have the awareness that, that you couldn't have be the boy with the cup. you got to have that awareness. Sometimes people don't look at that, and then when they get out there and that actually happens, then they blame the world for everything they've done when actually you had the choice. That actually brings me to my next question, um, because as, as you promote the, the, the movie and it gets bigger and so on and so forth, um, when you do, if I had done a, a search for American Bully, I noticed that there was a 2009 movie that had come out, or 2011, with the same name. How are you, um, and people are probably looking for your movie and they're coming across that. How, were there any uh, copyright issues that you had to get around, or how how are you addressing it so most people know about or differentiate your movie from their movie? It hasn't actually been uh, any, I haven't had any uh, whirlwind with that as of yet. Um, I've noticed that as well. Um, But uh, the two movies definitely differ, Um, even in context, even in look. You know, it's two different aspects of the movie. One is based on kids alone. 
and the other one is based on like a you know a, 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 a slew of other things as well so i haven't I haven't ran into any issues as of yet, but we, I, I guess as the months come along, I think we'll, we'll tackle that as, as it comes, but there has not been any issues at all with that. Uh, I haven't had anybody call me up and say, hey, well, you know, I, I couldn't find your movie or anything, or I couldn't find your trailer because people are finding it. And they, they, you know, I guess because I'm my face and my name is going with the promotion of it, I think it makes it easier to find myself. Or, or you know any uh, publicity about it? Awesome, awesome. So yeah, I think that, being the forefront, I, I think that that director, whoever the director is for that film, he's not the face of the film. He's using just the film itself to promote itself. Where I, for my films, I'm using actually me to promote it. You know, I'm just mm. really hands on with it, and I'm in everybody's face with it. So kind of dif- dif- differentiate the uh, the look of the the whole thing. Awesome. And with that, if you could leave where people could find out more about the movie, your YouTube channel, your socials, um, where people could find out and check out American Bully. Um, definitely. Uh, we're, like I said, we're working on a distribution deal. Um, and hopefully in the next three months we'll have something up for people to stream, download, and, and buy. Uh, but you can also you can follow me on Facebook, um, Facebook dot me slash illadel styles you can um follow me there we have an official uh american bully uh movie uh page on facebook as well you can follow me on instagram under jermaine quick producer and you can follow me on twitter under eq philly um they won't allow you to change your name on you can only do it once and that's a done deal with them <laughs> and so that's why the name is on the, under eq philly my, my my old rap name so um and uh, just be on the lookout just for um, different promotion. Uh, you can definitely go to the GoFundMe page and um, look up American Bully um, State to State Tour, and any donation is uh, acceptable. Uh, um, definitely uh, want to tackle this issue one one state at a time and do the best we can to reach out to these kids that need it the most. Um, also, you can do the fundraising page on Facebook as well. Um, so there's multiple avenues, uh, mostly YouTube, Facebook, um, Instagram. I'm not a Snapchatter, so I don't do Snapchat. Like, Snapchat is 24 hours for me. It's like, <laughs> it's a waste of time. But, you know, follow us on Instagram. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a cool thing. We've got Paul Haggis following us on Instagram. This is a, this is a dope thing. And Rihanna. So I'm kind of excited, you know. They've been commenting, doing their thing. So that's a good thing. Cool. Very nice. Very nice. Any other questions, David? Um, well, the one question I was, was wanted to ask, I was going to try to get it in there, was just simply, um, as a filmmaker, when you watch movies nowadays, do you can you simply just sit there and watch and enjoy a movie, or do you find yourself noticing all the different uh, things that particular director might bring to a movie, like the angles he uses, just anything? Do you find yourself just looking at those kind of things in a movie, or do you just sit You're, back and enjoy it like everyone else? I, I wish you to ask those questions a half an hour ago. That's the questions that get me excited. Yes, when I was coming up, I really did not look at movies the way I look at them now. Like, I was just excited about whatever was going on, but now I'm looking at angles. I'm looking at lighting. I'm like, oh, I see why they got that color scheme in there. It makes it gives it a certain mood. You know, it just – you just get intrigued by the whole thing. So now when you go back to do your project, it now it gives you more depth. It makes your project mean more to you because it's like now you know why certain things are a certain way they are. Some people just yeah. get a camera and they shoot, but they don't understand why certain scenes have certain pictures or why certain scenes have certain chairs or certain color schemes or certain angles and what it really means. Like that's what I look at it for and I say, I see why. You know my favorite show is – uh, CSI. I love CSI, and I love Law and Order. I mean, even though they're just TV shows, it's just the way they set everything up. It just makes it look dope. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm into that type stuff. Now I am. Like, I'm. before I was not. Like, I really wasn't into it. That's what brings out the excitement with me when it comes to film. If you ask me stuff like that, I can laugh and joke with you all day because that's what I'm into film. Like, I really love that type stuff. 
Yeah, yeah. And the reason I ask is because so many times I've watched the movie and I'm like, man, I wish I could have been on the set when they filmed that particular scene, just to see everything that goes into it. And I've also noticed with, you know, certain directors have certain things that they do within their movies, like Quentin Tarantino. He has a particular style. Same with Spike Lee. He does certain things within his movies, and I, I recognize it every time I say, like, oh, that's a Spike Lee thing. Uh, Steven Spielberg, same thing. So I always find it interesting that that little subtle things that a director will kind of put his stamp and his style on on his movies. Yeah, like Spike Lee has this thing where it looks like the character is walking with the camera. Exactly. It's like they're floating or something down yeah. the street. Yeah, you know, that's dope. Like, yeah, yeah. So when you when you talk about stuff like that, yeah, definitely that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for different styles, you know. Just Quentin Tarantino's movies to me are very gritty. They're very uh, um, cut edge in your face type thing, like you know, like the blood is right there, like in your face, like. <laughs> so you know, I I kind of got his grit when I watch his movie, but you know, just a certain things like I just watch. I like angles, like I'm an angle guy. I really like different angles, maybe shooting through a keyhole just to to get the perspective of the person. You know, I, it's just little stuff like that just makes the bigger difference. Like when you're doing shooting a film, like and uh, you know, the regular eye just not trained to, to even look at it. They just looking at the film, you know. But you know, if you're really in the film, you're like, wow, that was dope. You know, so yeah, yeah. I, I get excited about film when you talk about that type of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who cares about, you know, if I make it to Hollywood or not? If I shoot a dope film like that and everybody likes it, and you know, it's just, that's all I really care about. <laughs> Sometimes that's just be it. Wow. All right. Cool. That answers that. <laughs> that's what yeah. I want to ask. <laughs> yeah, we, and we definitely want to have you back in the future and talk about future collaborations, maybe for the next movie or, you know, what was the thought process? Because it, it seems like you had this in the bag and then, uh, that circumstances happen were really helped to propel you and propel just the subject matter. So I'm sure that if you have other socially related movies or just even just fun movies, comedies, whatever, we we'd love to stay in touch with you to find out as you continue to grow in your business. Yeah, I appreciate it. Yeah, we're definitely um, working on a new movie. Um, it's called Conceal Habitat Two. It's a uh, continuation of uh, my second film and. Uh, we're going to have some comedians in there. We're going to have a lot of things. I'm working on a documentary as well. Uh, i got got some things in the bag. And, you know, like I said, we just keep moving. We don't, you know, I, I really can't think about all the negatives and the positives or whatever. I just just like to keep shooting. And you never know what tomorrow brings. You know, tomorrow is just a whole new exciting thing. And if I end up moving, I, I'll let you know about that. <laughs> I'll definitely let you know. <laughs> we'll just go from there. You know, you see me in New York and I'm on the billboard. You say, wow, he did actually get up, didn't go, did he? <laughs> Yeah. No yeah. doubt, because I'm sure people are going to want to get your feedback on Black Panther, and, and as a filmmaker, what, what was your take on how they chose to approach it? Uh, yeah, I know that's just going to be a, a touchy story, you know. That's definitely one of those stories you got to continue to read up on, because I heard so many different stories about it. So it's always going to be the generic version of what you get, you know. I think Ray, uh, if you remember Ray Charles, that was, to me, that was the generic version of what Ray was. Really to you know, <laughs> with some things they showed, some things they didn't. I think the Biggie story was a generic version of what Biggie <laughs> uh, went through. But you know, uh, touchy stories. Touchy stories always have uh, different things that's going to be missing that you're not. You know, the average person that doesn't know the story or didn't read up on it is just going to accept it for what it is. Like I said, film is a gift and curse, man. Uh, social media is a gift and curse. You only see what people just show you right immediately, but you don't know the story behind it. Yeah, no, that's a really good point. Very good point. Actually, that's a good point to, to actually stop. We are at the top of the hour. Uh, so we definitely appreciate it having you on, Jermaine. And uh, he has the upcoming movie, or it's out right now. They're touring for American Bully. Uh, keep an eye out for that. And, and anything future that he has as well, the past movies was Rise Like Cream. He has Concealed Habitat 1. So make sure you check out his portfolio of movies. And with that, the, you have been in tune to another podcast of Intrinsic Motivation of a Homie's Perspective. I am Hamza. And I am David. And Jermaine, thanks so much. We really appreciated having you on. Thank you for the opportunity. You guys have an awesome day on purpose. Go yes. Eagles. Go yes. Eagles. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers, man. All right. All right. 
Thanks again for checking out another episode of Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective podcast. Please check us out on our website at intrinsicmotivation.life where you can click on the speak pipe button and leave any suggestions for a future podcast that you'd like us to cover. Also check us out on our social media sites. We have a YouTube channel, Facebook page, iTunes podcast, in addition to Stitcher and Google Play, all under Intrinsic Motivation from a Homie's Perspective. Check you out next time. Have a great day.